right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode three of the Torah Visuals podcast. You've already watched videos, episodes one, two, and three. You've listened to podcasts one and two, and we're ready to get into podcast number three. It's very exciting. Um, the video starts right away. You, It's keeping the same motif that we've had going, how the letters of God's energy, that's what creates us. That is... Those letters are in reality right now. And the Alter Rebbe is building a narrative here. Everything works from one step to the next. We started off with that statement from the Baal Shem Tov, that all the letters are out there in reality, keeping reality in place. And then the next step after that was that God is actively orchestrating and making everything go exactly where it is. And that was this past video where we saw the concept of Hashkacha Pratis. Hashkacha Pratis is that God is actively moving everything and he's the director of the, of the movie film. And he says, okay, we're gonna have the car enter from there and cut, no, bring it back, let's get. And God is making everything go exactly as he wants it to be. So the way we illustrated this actually, it's really cute. You should, I don't know if you know the story or not, but the Baal Shem Tov had a story to describe Ashkach Pratis with his students. One of the students asks him, he says, come on, Baal Shem Tov, what are we talking about? God, God is in the middle of, it was windy and they saw the leaves fluttering. He's like, God's actively fluttering those leaves? Come on, that's such a minute detail. And he's like, yeah, you see that leaf that just fell? Go look under it. And they look under and they see a worm. And the Baal Shem Tov explained that the worm was crossing the street and the sun was baking on it. And he cried out to God. The worm was like, God, if you're out there, help me. I'm, I'm, I'm overheated. I, I can't go on. And God answered his prayers. And the leaf falls off and it covers him and gives him shade, saving his life, the worm. So we did a spin on that where the leaf saves our character's life. So that is the detail. And you think about it, by the way. We're making animations now. Every single thing that you will see on that screen was put there. And we are, you know, still, you know, at the beginning levels of this animation game, not, you know, I, I, I'm loving on my, on our animators. But we're talking about the greatest movie director ever to exist, that they have every little detail worked out. And there was a, there was a guy, I forget his name, but he, he said that if you have a gun resting on the table in scene one, in act one, then by act three, that gun better shoot. So... The point is, is that if in today's day and age, a director has such meticulous detail down to his set, down to his lighting, down to every movement of the hair. So if they could have that, then God, who is on an infinite different level, of course, he's orchestrating every minute detail. So that's what's going on in that opening sequence. And you see the leaf save the guy's life because that's God orchestrating. So that was also a nice little shout out to the Baal Shem Tov because these are still the ideas that we're discussing from him. Now, there's another detail over here. There's a difference between Hashkacha Pratis and Hashkacha Klalis. Hashkacha Klalis would be, let's say you, um, you have your kids, right? And you put them in a room and you're watching, you know, and, and you put the right toys in there that are safe and and child-friendly, and no sharp objects, and all the walls are padded, it's all good. So you're monitoring the situation, but yeah, let them run, you know? The kids, they're running. I see if anything gets out of hand, I'll intervene. That's Ashkacha Klalis, a general taking charge and observation and, you know, guiding. Ashkacha Pratis is not like that. It's like the animator. The animator makes the character move exactly how he wants. So that's on a whole other level. And God is doing the Hashkaka Pratis. He's doing the active, energizing this now. It's unbelievable. Now, just one thing I want to point out, because the next sequence that we move into after the intro is you see a guy playing a video game. So our animators, and we, we sat and we forbranged about this and we discussed it, but the animators, what we did was we have different planes 
of animation, different styles of animation to describe different planes of reality. So when we talk about God, you have this nice 3D, the letters are rotating in space and you have this energy and it's this like really in depth and that's the spiritual realms. And then when we have the physical, when we're talking about our life, you have a regular 2D character in a 2D plane and that different dimension is showing you that the, the, the spiritual reality is that much thicker and deeper and authentic. So that was intentional. There are two different styles there because you have the spiritual reality and the physical reality. Then when we're talking about how the man plays the game, so we show you, here's a different dimension. This is the 8-bit and the Mario tune going on in the background, which shout out to Isaac. He made this incredible 8-bit track, but it's to a niggin. And if you listen out throughout the whole episode, you'll hear that's kind of the niggin behind the whole episode. It's really cool. Um, so these different levels of animation are there trying to immerse you in like a different experience. When we're talking about spiritual realms, it's in that 3D. When we're talking about the physical realm, it's in 2D. When we're talking about how man could control other things like the video game, that's in 8-bit and 8-track. So that was all intentional. You should be aware of it and you'll see it as it comes up. Really, really cool stuff. So now here comes the real question, which really prompted the concept of having a podcast at all. When, when we were discussing to our visuals, there was no conversation of a podcast. And then when we got to this part where we were saying how God controls everything and animates and puts it and directs it and coordinates it. So the, some of the team was like, wait a minute, what about free will? You just wiped free will off the table. And in truth, the Alter Rebbe in this part of Tanya does not deal with free will. This is all discussing God's perspective and God's ultimate objective true reality. And in that reality, he orchestrates everything and he makes it all work. And he's energizing you and he's moving you and he planned you. There is no concept of, but what about me? In the first section of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe discusses our perspective and our avaida and how do I live my life and what if I'm feeling sad and what if I'm feeling happy? It's from the lens of the human and in that part of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe does discuss the concept of free will. So when this moment came up in the episode, it was like, okay, okay, we, we've got to discuss this. This is not something we just sweep under the table and therefore we decided to create the podcast. Now that we have it, I'm very happy we do. And let's get into this discussion of free will versus determinism, preordained, where God is in control. So who's making decisions? Who's the captain of the ship? So first of all, this is the oldest question in philosophy. This is once they brought up a God and that there's God has power and he controls everything. They're like, wait, so what about me? This is the oldest question. That was the first question. Now, it's interesting that philosophers have been doing this for all of eternity, but now there's also like a scientific approach because before we knew about God and us. Now they're bringing other factors into it. If you look at the um, determinist scientific minds of today, what they discuss is, is that you have genes, you have a genetic code that was passed down by your parents, and then that gives you your predisposition, who you will be, how you will be, then you're placed in an environment, certain circumstances, and depending on your circumstances, that'll shape what you do and how you think. So between your genes and your environment acting on you, they could almost predict, and they can't yet, so the you know this is still a theory, but theoretically, if we could have enough data, we would be able to predict what you will do. If we knew all your genes, and we knew every aspect of your environment, then we would know exactly what you would do. And it's just you playing out the story that your genes put in you. So there is no choice over there. Furthermore, they found a study where they saw your brain firing in which direction you will go before you knew which direction you will go. If there is an option, right or left. So they see the brain scan go, we're going right. And then like a second later, he went right. 
So eh, it has been debunked, whatever. It's all the science back and forth. This is pretty new stuff. But the point here is, is that it has entered the realm of science and psychology. So I just found that fascinating where we're not just talking about religion and philosophy, it's gotten to science and psychology, which to me is just incredible because ultimately we wanna marry all these together. If we're saying that God is creating the world and God is true, it says that the signature of God is truth. So what is the concept of truth? Is that it's true from the beginning to the end, A to Z. The word truth in Hebrew is MS, Aleph, Mem, Suf. The Aleph is the first letter, Mem is the middle letter, Suf is the last letter. So MS has to be true through and through. So God creates the world and he does it in this realm, meaning it comes down into a natural physical place. So there must be that the science of how the world works has to mirror and mimic how God works. So I like this idea where the science and the religion starts, you know, talking hand in hand. So let's get to it. You have on the physical, you know, talking about genes, you have two camps. There is the free will camp and the deterministic camp. The people who say hard determinism, 100%, you make no choices in this world. You are just a program acting out on its environment. And a very big proponent of that was B.F. Skinner. He's a big... He was a behavioral psychologist. And he, according to him, you make no decisions. The problem with that is, is that then you can't be culpable. You can't be liable for doing bad things. Oh, you know why he stole? Because his family is starving and, and he grew up without knowing how to do a job and no education. So you can't blame him. It's just the, his circumstance. So if you make no decisions, it's just your genes acting out in its environment, then how could you punish a guy? You know why he did it and he didn't choose. So that's the hard determinists. The pure free will people, they say, nope, that yes, there are environments and yes, there are genes, but that's all inside of me and I am the real captain of the ship and I choose. And the reason why they say that, according to the sciences anyway, is more of a... It's like too scary to say otherwise. It's too scary to say that you have no choice and it's all just happening. So just to hold on to a sense of self, of, of some form of agency, so they claim the free will. Whereas there are the people in the middle called soft determinism where they say, yes, there are genes and it gives you a predisposition and you're in an environment. And if you grew up with a good education, that's one you know, possible outcome of your life. And if you were brought up with no education, that's another trajectory. But you still have choice. Yes, maybe your genes, you're not the smartest. And maybe you did, came from an environment that did not have the best education. You still can make it in this life. We've seen it again and again throughout history, throughout, you know, people you know, friends you know. The guy who just wasn't the smartest kid in school, but then he hustled and he made it happen. So... That's the soft determinism camp. They say that there are genes, there are environment, but you could rise above. Now let's see what the rabbis say. What about free will and determinism according to the philosophers? So first of all, it says in the Torah, it says that God puts in front of you life and death. God says, choose life. If the Torah and God Say choose, that means a proof from the Tyra, you have free will. You have choice. It's in the Tyra. It said you could choose. That is the basis of man's will in this world. The Tyra said so. On the other hand, you could see that God knows the past, present, and future. And we said clearly in this video that God has a shkacha pratis. He's orchestrating and activating everything. What do you do there? So there have been different ideas that have been suggested over the, the days and the years and the history and the centuries. But one idea that came forth is that just because I know what you will do doesn't mean I'm influencing your choice. God could see into the future because he's above time and it's all happening now. So he knows what you could do because he could see it because he's in the future, but that doesn't influence your choice. Imagine, for example, that you taped a football game. Right, You tape the football game and you've watched the game and you've seen it already 
Then you go back to the beginning, you watch it again. You know what's going to happen. You know whether he makes the touchdown, whether he gets the tackle, whether he makes a fumble. You know this. But your knowledge is not what caused that tackle to happen or that turnover or anything. You know, and it has no effect on the outcome. So God, he's above time and place, so he knows, but he doesn't choose for you. He knows because time is not a factor for him. Fine. That was one answer that they give. Now, it's very interesting because what, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to marry two opposites together. Now, this is just my own thought. But what I would say is, is that God, and this is all of what we're doing in Shar Yechud Vemunah, the whole study of this series is trying to understand how God does two opposite things at once. That he is simultaneously infinite and endless. And in that state of infinity, we can't exist. You cannot stand in the face of infinity. A finite being gets swept up and wrapped up and it, you, you just get what they call buttle. You get just overwhelmed and you're just one with infinity. But at the same time, God is creating this finite world and I do exist for real. And this is all that we're trying to explain over here, which we're going to get into in the future videos. You'll see it's coming. But the point is, is that God does opposites and they are both true. And how does that work? We don't know yet. It says that if you knew how God operates, you would be God. And we were learning the other day with a couple of friends. They were saying how that wasn't saying as an admonishment that you will never know because only God knows. It's saying fakir. It was saying on the. It was saying exactly the opposite. It was saying try to know, try to understand, because when you do, you will be me, and that's when we could be one. And I personally believe that our trajectory throughout history, from every angle has gotten closer to understanding this. At the beginning of time, we had the Chumash, we had the five books of Moses, and that was a very cut and dry, like, you know, this is the world, there's a God, okay, he's way beyond. And then over history, we still don't know God, you can't know God just yet, but Chassidus is deepening and deepening and deepening our understanding of God. And you can see it, Maisha Rabbeinu, it says that he saw up to levels in Atsilus. That's one of the, that's the highest world. But it said, well, really, he only saw into Bria. That's the second world. He saw Atsilus the way it dresses into Bria. Okay. And he didn't really see the highest levels of Chachma, Bina, and Das. Really, he saw how Chachma, Bina, and Das go into Chesed and Gvur. And really, he didn't see that. He saw how Chesed and Gvur go into Netzachayr in your side. Okay. So Maisha was able to see up to the world of Bria in the realm of Netzachayr in your side. But then later in history, thousands of years later, the Arizal perceives even beyond Atzillus to before the Tzimtzum. And he goes even higher. And then you could read the Rebbe Hashab and he's going into the minutia of a Tzimtzum and a Roshim and a Rishimu and it gets wild. How are we deepening our understanding? And then you could look at science. Back in the day, oh, what's making the sun rise? You know, if they weren't uh, Jewish or religious, they'd say it's, it's uh, the sun itself is some kind of God. And oh no, so then we learn a little bit about gravity and now our understanding evolves and it evolves and we're getting smarter and we're getting better. And for a long time, science was replacing God. There's no God, it all works because X, Y, Z. We could explain it. But now we're not at the end of science, but we're nearing our adolescence. Science as it enters... Eh, we're probably deep into adolescence. Let's say we're 17 years old as scientists, as, as the world of science. So now, as teenagers, we have a bit of a better understanding. And when you get to the minuscule, 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 you end up in the quantum era. In the quantum zone, they see two opposites exist. It's a wave, it's a particle, it's both at once. We don't fully understand it yet, but we're getting closer. So this idea of, is God determining what we do or do we have free will? The answer is both. 
Is it a particle? Is it a wave? It's both. And however we need to rationalize that to make it set, make sense in our minds, that's fine. And I could talk about that for another few minutes. In fact, I will. But the point is, is that it is an oxymoron. And it is happening at once. And we're getting better at sitting with that and being comfortable with that. Quantum. It is a particle. It is a wave. That's it. So that's basically the idea. And just something to say about this is when you look in the past, you say God determined it. If that's how it went, God has a plan. When you're looking in the present, in what you should do, you have to think about your own free will. What do I do now? Not to say that you supersede God. Heaven forbid. God's always in control because, again, both are happening at the same time. But just something to keep in your own mind is the past was determined. I can't change the past. God had a plan. That's how it went. The present, I have free will. I'm going to choose my fate. And a minute after that, that's how God figured it out. It's fine. So that's the idea of free will. And there's tons of people who talk about this. And it's the oldest question. And go down the rabbit hole. I loved going down the rabbit hole for this. Um... So that's the idea of free will. And that's what we portrayed in our video where you see that we gave the example of a gamer and essentially we're calling that God is the gamer playing us. Like, like you set up a sim town or, you know, you set up any one of these things and you control it. So God is playing us and still we make our own choices. I put my fingers up like this, you know, I'm shaking my hands. But God is also how quantum go figure it out. God. So that's the idea of free will as far as we can understand. Now, the next part that we wanted to discuss, the next sequence in the video is a difference between man and God. And again, Lahavdil, like that's a huge difference. But one thing they want to say is, is that man, we create stuff all the time. Why do we say God is the creator and we're just not the creators? We're creators. We create stuff all the time. The difference is, is that when we create something, we can only start with matter that already is. I could take wood, chop it up, and make a bench out of it. Beautiful. I can't make wood. You can't just fabricate wood. Even nowadays, when we're getting to like crazy, crazy places in science where, you, where they're like making DNA from scratch, you know, they, they made insulin and it's a synthetic and they built the DNA code. And yeah, that's incredible. But they still had to start with those bases and nucleotides. They, they couldn't have nothing. You need something to make something. Whereas God is making the thing as well as making the thing. <laughs> He's making the material you build it out of. Then he goes and makes the thing. And then he continues to energize it. And then he manipulates and moves it. Every inch of this is A to Z God. The material it's made out of, the composition it's in, the laws that'll, that'll govern it, the way it'll act, the story, the drama, A to Z, end to end, God, God, God. What's very cool is this final sequence over here. Well, it's not the final sequence, but the next sequence is where we go into nature and... You see how nature is so beautiful and miraculous. That's the real point that the altar ever wants to drive home here. Nature is a miracle because it's being brought into existence now, now, now. God, again, just recreated the world. Now, now, now. It's brand new. And it's always happening. So this is an idea that it's happening right now. That is a greater miracle than miracles. Because what's a miracle? A miracle takes nature that is and it moves it around. It's almost like what we said about man. Man takes nature, takes a piece of wood and turns it into a bench. So God, when he's doing a miracle, will keep the sun in the sky higher, right? It says there was a great miracle that, you know, Joshua was fighting the war and the sun was going to set and he needed daylight. So he prays and the sun stays in the sky. What a miracle. So God's taking existing sun and all the, we, we know now that it's not just keeping the sun up, but it's all the different 
movements of of gravity that'll make everything shift. And he he takes what is and he makes a massive miracle. It's a big deal. He keeps it in the sky. But he was keeping what already was and just manipulating it. Whereas nature, God is recreating from nothing, out of nothing, into existence all the time. That is a massive, massive miracle. And again, just a nice shout out to the Baal Tov, just because we love doing that. In the example that we gave in that scene to see the wagon taking off. So that's an ode to all the stories it says about the Baal Shem Tov that he used to take his students on these adventures where they would go and say, oh, we need to go see this Jew out in this, out in this city and we got to see what he's up to because there's some real spiritual energy going on over there. And they would travel and somehow they'd cross mass distances, just vast, wide, faraway distances. They'd get there, boom, like this. So how did he go so fast? There's a term called kfitza saderech. Kfitza saderech literally means that you kind of like fold the road. If the road is a mile long and I fold the road up, 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 now it's only five feet long, now I walk. And then God unfolds the road and now I'm a mile away. So that's how the Baal Shem Tov, in a spiritual, miraculous sense, would get around really quickly. Zalman Kleinman, he was a great, phenomenal artist and he had a painting done of the Baal Shem Tov and his students flying in the sky in the cart in the horse and buggy. And we did an ode both to Rabbi Kleinman and to the Baal Shem Tov that that was the miracle we chose to show <clears throat> that God could either take existing horse and existing cart and make it fly. And that's an amazing miracle. But even greater than that is making reality out of nothing, not out of pre-existing. And that's the biggest miracle of all. So that is what's going on in this video. And the whole point of it is trying to give you a sense of of orchestration and destiny and plan and not at the cost of your free will and determinist and choices. You choose. Just to get back to that conversation, just because I brought it up again, I thought of something. God has a plan. The plan is to get from point A to point B. And maybe in God's plan, there was a simple line that went from A to B. Now your choice is... I want to go take a detour. I want to go left. Oh, I'm going left. You will end up at B. You will get to where God wants to go because the plan will continue. It might have to take a little longer. You might have to go on a detour and then realize that that was wrong and then have some, some, some story that sends you back uh, to the original point or to completely somewhere else and eventually you'll end up at B because God's plan will be. You have choice, you have decision. And where did you get that decision from? Where do you get that choice from? Because again, we said, God said, but more than that, God created us in his image. What does that mean? In a big way, what that means is that he gave you free will. He gave you choice. God is the only one who can choose and he gave that to you. So we have that. So there is a plan. There is a destiny. History is on a path. This is all happening. You still have choice because God endowed you with that. You are empowered. You're beautiful. Choose good. And a friend of mine has a beautiful song. He says, you make good choices. You make good choices. So make good choices. And we hope to see you at the next videos and at the next podcasts. Thank you so very much. And good luck on the journey.